Deuteronomy chapter 20. Let's all stand if you would. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Starting in verse number 1, the Word of God says this. It says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house, and hath not dedicated it? Let him go, and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard, and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go, and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife, and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. And the officer shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. And it shall be, when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, and then proclaim peace unto it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much again for your love for us and your mercy. I thank you for this great church and the, what you're doing here through First State Baptist Church, Lord, reaching this community. Lord, I'm just thankful for the vision that they have of reaching Wilmington. Lord, a city that is very dark and in need of you, Lord. Lord, I ask, Lord, that you please would just have your hand of blessing and protection upon this people and Upon their pastor, Lord, as Pastor Knickerbocker travels home, Lord, please uh, give him traveling mercies. Lord, I do pray for Brother Frith's uh, mother-in-law, Lord, as she's in the hospital and uh, serious injury. I ask, Lord, please, you would just heal her body. And Lord, just, uh, Lord, that she would have complete healing. Lord, we love you. Lord, we uh, ask, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning. I know, Lord, that there is a message here that you have put in my heart. Lord, to give out this morning because we need it. And Lord, uh, I ask, Lord, that you please would just help us to respond in obedience to the message that you have. Lord, I ask, Lord, that any distractions this morning will be put aside. Lord, any inhibitions to your word, Lord, would be put aside. And Lord, that your name will be glorified. Lord, that we would leave here thinking, holy, holy, holy is our God. Lord, I thank you and praise you, for it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I heard a story uh, back a while back when we went to uh, down south to the Sword of the Lord conference. Has anybody been here? Had a chance to go to the Sword of the Lord conference? Good. Yeah. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go uh, to the Sword of the Lord conference, very beneficial thing to go to. And uh, it's down. Is it North or South Carolina? South Carolina, right? North Carolina. Okay, I always get them confused. And uh, if you do get a chance to go down there, not long or not far away is a place called Sandy Creek. It's where uh, Shubel Stearns, um, he, uh, he preached out of their little church there at Sandy Creek and uh, planted many, many churches all across the south. And uh, thus the Bible Belt. You know, you go down into the south and you'll see Baptist churches all over the place. Uh, largely in part of Shubel Stearns and that, that Sandy Creek Church. And uh, you'll see that there's a building uh, still standing there, and uh, also his grave is there that it's marked. And uh, but it's, it, that, that is well worth the visit if you ever have a chance to go down there. But anyways, I heard a, a preacher uh, down there at the Sword of the Lord Conference uh, tell a story about uh, two men. One of them uh, was named Harry, and the other's name was Clarence. And uh, they grew up in the back hills of West Virginia. And uh, these two men had a feud that dated back uh, well beyond their years. You know, their families always fought. They were just, uh, it was like the Hatfields and the McCoys. You had Harry versus Clarence. <laughs> and uh, their properties were separated by a ravine. 
And nearly once a week, they would uh, come catch eye of each other on the edge of their properties and, uh, you know, they'd shout insults across the ravine at each other and challenge each other to fights, but uh, they never could get to each other because they were always uh, separated. And uh, boy, Harry thought, man, one of these days, you know, if I ever get to that guy Clarence, I'm going to show him a thing or two. And uh, one day, great news came, and uh, they, they learned that uh, West Virginia uh, Department of Transportation, they were going to be putting in a road and a bridge that was going to cross the ravine. So finally, they'd be able to get at each other. There was a connection. And uh, boy, for months, they were working on that bridge and so forth. And uh, finally, the day came that that bridge was going to be complete. Harry was going to be able to march across that bridge and confront Clarence. And uh, Boy, he just got ready. He was pre getting ready for it, you know, getting himself ready. And uh, finally that morning came. He's so excited. He gets up early, gets himself a nice breakfast. And uh, his wife was very much against him going down there. You know, you just let that thing die, Harry. You know, God will take care of it. And, uh, but Harry decided he would go down there. And uh, he marches out of the house that morning and gets down there to the bridge. And within 15 minutes, Harry was back at the house. And, uh, you know, not a scuff on him, completely clean, you know, everything, everything looking good. And his wife said, well, you know, what happened? You, you don't look like you were in a fight. It looks like everything is fine. And he said, I got down there to that bridge, and I didn't realize Clarence was so big. It says right on top of the bridge, Clarence 10 feet. <laughs> <laughs> so he ran back home. <laughs> I said all of that for a very lame joke. <laughs> but uh, here's the thing. We are all involved in battles, aren't we? Not physical battles like that, but spiritual battles. We really have our head in the sand if we don't realize that. We live in a very dark world where there's a lot of things going on. A lot of legislation uh, coming out of uh, Dover and uh, you know, a lot of uh, wickedness going on. The morality of our nation is certainly uh, on the decline. I saw... Um, a statistic, you know, so I've at different times shut off my Fox News app because I just get tired of hearing some of the stuff. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is a conservative news outlet, so I try to stay current on some of the things. And, you know, I'm hearing about how much of our nation is for socialism and, uh, you know, not capitalism. And, you know, uh, there's some very socialist type people coming up in politics that, you know, they have no idea how to pay for the things that they're offering. Um, but, uh, but my point is, though, is that we live in a very tough time. You know, I, I love the uh, soul winning and uh, visitation and outreach program that you have going here. From what I understand, every day somebody's doing something to get the, to get the calls of the gospel out. Is that right? Uh, whether it's putting uh, John Romans together or praying or it's every day. I, I think I saw a sign-up sheet back there that, uh, that, that guys have re recently started. I think that's awesome. And... Uh, well, I tell you, uh, soul winning has changed over the years. This Word of God hasn't changed, praise the Lord. It's the same power. Uh, it just has to be delivered. And, uh, you know, I think about how, uh, you know, areas that I know didn't, even in Dover, where we used to go at one time, uh, sometimes, um, you know, was very receptive to, uh, you know, us coming in and going door knocking, that, uh, that now we have been uh, chased out of. And, uh, you know, trying to do everything uh, possible the world is to try to inhibit the Word of God. But I'm, I'm thankful that the Word of God is still powerful. But, uh, yes, we are going through some spiritual battles. And uh, Deuteronomy here is written by Moses, of course, and is part of the Pentateuch or the books of the law, these first five books of the Bible. And I notice that when you look through the uh, book of Deuteronomy, and you look at when it was written. Of course, it doesn't say it in there, but it's something. if you have a Bible that has notes, that a lot of times it'll say when a passage was written. And uh, those are a little different from Bible to Bible. Of course, that's not inspired. That's just what man has gone back and estimated. But uh, my Bible says 1451 B.C. And again, your Bible may be a little bit different than that. Um, but if you go to the book of Joshua, you'll notice that it starts at the same uh, time period, the same, the same point. And my point in saying this is that when you're here in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the, uh, the context of what is being spoken about here is they are on the east side of the Jordan River, just about, going, just about ready to go over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And uh, 
you'll see a lot of last minute uh, messages by Moses here uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, some encouragement for when they go over in, into the promised land. And he warns them that there's going to be very many, many battles in the promised land. And he's giving them some instruction. He says here in verse number one, it says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses, and all chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. You know, I think about that, that the enemy there, uh, we know that out of the verse here, it says that they have horses and chariots. And we know that they're outnumbered when he says, be not afraid of them. And he says that, that the Lord thy God is with thee. You know, we know that there's many Old Testament stories uh, throughout the history. Uh, it's a historic record here in the Bible. And, and we see uh, uh, throughout history, we see that God does a great thing with a small people against an enemy that appears very large. And that's exactly what we have going on right here. Here we have the Israelites, the, the Jewish people. They're on the east side of the river, and, and they're really a nomadic type people. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They're not trained soldiers. Or, you know, They don't have all of the weapons of warfare. And here they are about to go into the promised land, the land that God has given them. And they are facing a, a, an enemy that is very fierce. Well, I think about our spiritual battle. And of course, uh, all of the Bible is relevant today. And I, I don't like to use that word relevant because so many people use that word today. Oh, this is relevant today. What's relevant Christianity? <laughs> Let's just stick to Bible Christianity. Amen? But here we have the Word of God in the Old Testament. And the, and the Bible is unlike any other book. It is a book that is written for our learning. It's not just a historic record. It's so we can gather something from it and use it today. And let's use this passage today to say, how am I going to get ready for the spiritual battles that lie ahead? Because there are spiritual battles that lie ahead. You know, I think about how we have spiritual battles. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have battles with sin, Romans chapter 7, 22 through 23, where the Word of God says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. We battle against sin. We battle against our flesh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are the contrary, the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Oh, we battle with the flesh. You're reminded of that every day. We battle with worldliness. 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Oh, there is a world that we are battling against. And it is so important for us as Christians to be prepared for the battle that lies ahead. Satan is absolutely re real. The devil is a roaring lion which walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy our testimony. He wants you to do nothing for the Lord. He accomplishes this by keeping us tied up in the, in the small things of this world and keeping us tied up in sin. Paul, probably the greatest Christian and missionary example in the Bible outside of Christ, Recognize this exact same thing when he said in Romans 7, 19, he says, For the good that I would do, do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. He was facing the same battles that you and I were facing. So what do we do with this great battle that is out there, the spiritual battle? Can I ask you, do you want to do something for the Lord? I hope everybody here wants to do something for the Lord. Do you want to have victory in your Christian life? I hope everybody here wants to have victory in their Christian life. Well, I see here in verse number 2, it says, And it shall be, when you are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. I want you to notice that phrase, come nigh unto the battle. I want to preach a message this morning with that title, come nigh unto the battle. 
And I want to encourage you this morning to, yes, this is a dark world out there. Yes, there's uh, many things that we're going to have to battle. Yes, it's going to be difficult to get up on a Saturday morning or, 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 or whenever you go on visitation or, or, or whether it's at the restaurant or at the gas station to be a gospel witness in this world. Yes, it's going to be uh, a difficulty, but come nigh into the battle. Get in the battle. So many Christians today are sitting in pews, punching their spiritual time clock, thinking that they're doing something for the Lord. Can I tell you, we can do nothing for the Lord. He owns it all. And we learned that this morning. He, he is the possessor of all things. He, boy, he, he allows us to have stewardship of those things. Let's, let's use what, we've, what God has given us for the Lord. Get in the battle. Don't wave the white flag of surrender. Don't settle for apathy. You know, I think about how God stirs us in messages and, and He brings to our mind things that we can do for the Lord. Well, let's get out there and do it. It's one thing to say, yes, Lord, and, and, and to kneel at this altar and say, Lord, use me however you want to use me, but let's go out and do it. Do something for God. Boy, He is holy, holy, holy. High and lifted up. I think about what this life is all about. We have such a short time to serve the Lord. It breaks my heart to think of uh, Brittany going away to college and Samantha will be right on her heels and uh, if that's how the Lord leads. And, but I think that God is, ha has given me those children, my children, to use for Him, to bring glory to His holy name, to do battle in this world. And I pray that God uses them and raises them up to do great and mighty things. Do you want that in your life? Do you want God to use you? I notice in this passage as they draw nigh into battle, very critical time, that Moses here gives some information that is very key to victory. And as I preach this message this morning, I just want you to notice those things here this morning. Apply them to your life. And be ready when you leave here to go out into battle. Some of you don't, maybe I may not know my, my background, but I just retired from the uh, Delaware State Police. Did 24 years there. And, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we do, uh, we'll execute search warrants like first thing in the morning. Six o'clock is when we're banging on the door. <laughs> Try to catch people when they're still in bed, amen? <laughs> Get that element of surprise. But you know, we don't just, uh, hey, let's meet up at the house at 6 o'clock, and uh, I don't know, one of you guys, maybe, you know, hey, Joe over here, why don't you go, you'll knock on the door, and, you know, we'll all go in. That's not the plan. <laughs> we're meeting at 4 o'clock <laughs> and getting our battle plan together. And then we're there, you know, at a, as a rush, getting there right at 6 o'clock, that's when you can first start a daytime search warrant and knocking on the door of some of these, uh, especially some of these houses that are, are drug houses and so forth, and going in. We have a battle plan. You know, in the Christian life, we need a battle plan. And uh, let's look at this passage here this morning, and I, I pray that it helps you. I want you to notice first that they preach the power of God. We serve a very powerful God. Imagine the scene here again. God's people here are gathered. The enemy is not far away, just on the other side of the river. Again, they're trained in battle. They have all the equipment for warfare, the chariots and horses and all of those things. They outnumber you. The crowd is no doubt, and I'm talking about the, God's people, I would imagine that there's some grumbling and some murmuring going on. <laughs> Wouldn't that be the tendency? And the priests step up in front of God's people. And I want you to imagine, as they step up in front of them, and a hush falls on the crowd. And then in verse number 3, they say this, And shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be terrified, ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God, 
is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies, to save you. Understand that this is not a motivational speech. This is not a speech that says, uh, boy, you know what? Uh, give it your best. You know, you can go after them. You know, dig deep, everybody, because we're going to go in there and we're going to really uh, give them what for. This isn't that kind of a speech. This is a thus saith the Lord. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. And I notice when he says here in verse number four, it says, For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Boy, I think about how we must rely on God's power and not our own strength. Boy, I tell you, if I had to rely on my own abilities, my own power, my own strength, I would be an utter failure. Thank God that He gives us the abilities that He does. Thank God that He goes with us and gives us strength and the ability to fight this battle that we have called life. You know, over and over, there is evidence throughout uh, the Bible, all of the Bible, how battles are won, not by man's strength, but by trusting in God. Here's just a few. I think about David when he fought Goliath. Amen? Boy, here's just a little guy. He goes out to battle against this gigantic man, and he's victorious, not because of his strength, but because of God's strength. I think about Israel when they went to the Battle of Jericho marching around that city seven times. <laughs> Who would have thought? But God's strength won that victory. I think about Daniel in the lion's den. Can you imagine Daniel being thrown down there into the den of lions and those lions all around them? But God shut up their mouths. That was God's strength, God's power that could accomplish that. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fiery furnace I think about Paul when he was beaten and shipwrecked and stoned and spent a night in the sea. I, I, I think about the Lord Jesus Christ when he went to Calvary and was obedient unto death, winning the greatest victory that was ever won. It was God's strength. All of these remind us of this God's strength and that his strength is what prevails. Can I remind you this morning that that same God is who we serve today? That same God that shut those lions' mouths. That same God that saved Noah and his family. The same God that caused the sun and the moon to stand still. The same God that paid for our sins. We serve him. Isn't it a privilege? We were talking about being a servant this morning. And I think about how we have the opportunity to serve that same God that created all of heaven and earth. That knows the future that has the plan. So thankful to be in His service. We serve a powerful God. Do we believe that same God can still do it? Back to our passage, I see some very uh, unique things here in verse number 4. It says, For the Lord your God is He that goeth with you. I see, number one, that He goes with us. He does not ever leave us in this battle alone. Paul stated in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5, For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I believe he was quoting Old Testament scripture in that passage because we find something very similar in Genesis 28, 15, Deuteronomy 31, 6 and verse number 8, Joshua 1, 5, and 1 Chronicles 28, 20, just to name a few. But I also see us here in verse number 4. Not only does he promise to go with you, it says to fight uh, for you against your enemies. He promises to fight for you against your enemies. He's not only going to be there with you, but he's going to fight for you. The Hebrew word for fight there actually has the meaning of to devour, consume, or destroy. Boy, I'm so thankful that God is on our side. Amen? Amen. Thankful that, that when we go into battle, when we go out into this world and we're serving the Lord and we're confronting tribulation, I, I'm thankful that not only is God with us, but He is in control of all things. Well, you'll see some strange things out there in the world when you're serving the Lord. If you say, Brother Mike, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what tribulation you're talking about. Well, then you're not in the battle. Amen? Because if you're in the battle, you're going to see it. You know, I think about sometimes when you go door knocking, some of, the, some of the, 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 the folks that you'll confront, and I'm so glad that God is there with us. 
Well, I could use ultimate, uh, many, many examples, but well, I think of one very specific. I remember, uh, I can't remember which one of my daughters I was with, but we were in downtown Dover, and um, this uh, opened the door, and number one, this guy answers the door in his underwear. <laughs> Hello, inappropriate, right? <laughs> and then uh, he proceeds to say that how he ought to shoot us, uh, knocking on my door like that. I'm like, uh, do you not have people knocking on your door? <laughs> you know, really it was the message. But what really made this particular visit stand out over any other visit was when I got into when I, the reason I was there and knowing for sure that he saved, he told me that he was a preacher. <laughs> a preacher! Saying that he was going to shoot me. <laughs> Answering the door in his underwear. I mean, come on! This world that we face, I'm so glad God is with us. I'm so glad that he's fighting our battles for us. I'm so glad that he is at work. And he says, lastly, in verse number four, the last promise is to fight. He says, uh, not only is he going to go with you to fight your, you against uh, your enemies, and he says, to save you. Sounds like an airtight plan. If we'll only trust in him. If we'll only get in the battle. We've been going through some, uh, boy, some great things here over the past month. Uh, it's been a very busy time at Capital Baptist. We uh, <coughs> started out, we had our anniversary Sunday at the end of June, and then um, we had a picnic and everything for that. But then we had Jubilee. Some of you all came down for Jubilee. And then uh, two weeks after that, we had Vacation Bible School. The week after that, we had a teen rally. And then uh, two weeks after that, we, uh, we just got back from teen camp. And uh, I kind of run the... Uh, uh, vacation Bible School, the teen rally, and the uh, teen camp. So, uh, Pastor Knickerbocker used to run that, and now I'm doing it. <laughs> but uh, it was some work. We faced some battles. We, uh, the teen rally went awesome. We had some teens that got saved, and you know, we bust teens in and so forth. And boy, we got out down there to the last minute. We were literally dismissing to the buses, and these two little, York, little girls with some attitudes wanted to get into a fist fight. Huh. I go jumping across a table to try to intervene, and uh, I'm not as young as I used to be, and I fell on the other side. <laughs> it was a comical thing to see, I'm sure. <laughs> but, you know, there were some battles involved in that whole thing, you know. Vacation Bible school, again, busing children in. I, I think on our high night we had uh, 160, which is less than what we normally have because uh, we excluded the teens from our Vacation Bible school because we knew we were having the teen rally. And then, of course, the uh, teen camp, uh, you know, that's a lot of preparation and everything. But over the course of that, all of that, God was with us Amen. and uh, got us through it, fought battles for us. And in the end, uh, upwards of 70 some people accepted Christ as their Savior. Amen. And I praise the Lord for that. It was nothing that myself or anybody else from Capital Baptist or anybody that did, it was all God. God did it. God fought the battle for us. God saved them. I say, what a great God we serve. He is a powerful God. He preached to them the power of God. But I also notice here, secondly, that this group of people that went to battle, they were not all of the popular people, perhaps you might say, large group of people, they were purged. Looking in Deuteronomy chapter 20 here in our passage, I see some people that were sent home. And I want to go over this list of people because I don't want you to be in that group. I want you to be in that group of people, God wants you to be in that group of people that are in the battle. And I, I see throughout Scripture that God frequently does this. And I think of Bal Gideon right off the bat, you know, when they purged the people and they were down to just 300 that went. I see how God uh, judged David when he went to number the people before the battle. Because God wanted them to rely on him, not the number of people. God repeatedly uses something small to accomplish something big. And I imagine when they're going into this battle and they're seeing, remember this great group of people over there with all the methods of warfare and all of that. I imagine the last thing that they were thinking 
is, well, let's purge the people. Let's send some people home. <laughs> I'm sure that that was not on our list of things to do. But God wanted them to have faith in God and to trust in God. And I see real quickly here, I, I see here in verse number 5, it says, And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying that, What man is there that hath built a new house, and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. I see that some people that were sent home were some people that were not fully dedicated. And let me ask you this morning, are you dedicated to the work of the Lord? That Hebrew word dedicated is used here to speak of such as dedicating a new house, and it's used other times in the Old Testament when uh, Solomon dedicated the house of the Lord. It is very clear here that the Bible, the message of the Bible, is that when, when, when we are saved, our bodies belong to the Lord. We are to be dedicated to the Lord and His work. And here in this battle, the people that were not dedicated to what God was doing were sent home. So we're talking about this battle here, and I hope you're among that people that say, yes, I want to get in the battle. Yes, I want to serve the Lord. Well, we must be dedicated to that work. Not a part-time thing, but a full-time thing, dedicating our lives to God's work. Speaking of Christ, in Titus chapter 2, and verse number 13, it says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Are you zealous for the Lord this morning? Are you dedicated to serve the Lord this morning? That word redeems means that he purchased us. Why did he purchase us? So that we might be that peculiar people, zealous unto good works. Stand out as a Christian. We should not just be a little bit better than the world. We should be entirely different than the world. Serving the Lord with all of our strength. We belong to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body and in your spirit which are God's. Again, are you fully dedicated this morning? Let me ask you a couple thought-provoking questions this morning. And by the way, they're very convicting to me as well. Do you see your job as a mean to, means to enhance the cause of Christ? Or are we doing it for earthly gain? Is your house a place just to show off? Or are you using it for God's glory? When you came to church this morning, that car that God gave you, are you using it for God's glory? Just send somebody to church this morning in that car. Do you have a, a, a stack of tracks when you leave here? You know, God didn't just provide the means to have tracks just to have them sit back there. They're, they're to give out for His glory. Boy, I think uh, sometimes how we'll, you know, hear a message and we'll grab some tracks and head out and we're like, oh, I'll stick them in my car. You know, I got a bunch of them right there in the pocket of the door of my car, right? Let's give them out. God is looking for a people that is dedicated Romans 12.1 tells us that, that we're, a living uh, we're to live a, a living, sa sacrificial, holy life. And that is our reasonable service. It's just reasonable. Not only did they send people home that were not dedicated, they also sent home people that were not fruitful. Look in verse number 6. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return into his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. We have another group here that's identified here that's planted a vineyard and has not eaten of it. He, doesn't ha he hasn't experienced any fruit. Certainly we know that the Bible has much to say about the unfruitful. The Bible tells us in Galatians 5 that to have victory over the flesh, we must walk in the Spirit. And when you walk in the Spirit, you will see the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, 22 20 through 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If we are going to have victory in battle, we must have God's fruit evident in our life. It is amazing how we think in our minds that we can put on some kind of facade, get our King James Bible and put it under our arm and go to church, wear the right clothes. But let's have fruit in our lives, our personal lives. Do you have fruit? If we're going to be in this battle, you must be a fruitful person. When was the last time you led somebody to the Lord? When's the last time that you've seen answered prayer? 
When's the last time that you felt God's spirit on you and, and, and to make decisions in your life that you know that it's of God? We should have a fruitful life, a life characterized by fruit. I see here also not only uh, what was it a people dedicated and a, and a fruitful people, but he also sent home another group here in verse number 7. It says, And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return into his own house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. He's, they sent home people that were not fulfilling promises. This man betrothed a wife. It was a promise. He had not fulfilled this promise. And he was headed into battle. God says, no, go ahead, go ahead and go home and fulfill your promise. I think about this church here, the bride of Christ. One day Christ will come and he will take his bride away. The Lord Jesus Christ, he paid a price with his own precious blood to secure us, his bride. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 4, it says, "...whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises." that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Certainly, the Bible has much to say about God's promises toward us. But the Bible also has this to say about our promises that we make toward God. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, it says in verse number 4 and 5, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. When we are saved, didn't we give up the right of controlling our life in exchange for salvation, didn't we? I think about how the biblical marriage is such a beautiful picture of salvation and our relationship with Christ. About how we're supposed to leave our old man and cleave unto Christ, just like in marriage we're to cleave to our wife, and cleave to each other. Let me ask you, when it comes to being ready for battle, are you keeping your promises? Have you made promises to God at this altar? Or in your personal time with God? And in fulfilling those promises. God is looking for a people that are fulfilling promises. If you're going to be ready for battle, you have to be dedicated, fruitful, and fulfill promises. He sends one last group here home. It's verse found in verse number 8. It says, And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto this house. Let his brethren, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Can I tell you that this battle is not for the fearful and faint-hearted? We have God's power with us. Amen. We are to live dedicated lives. Amen. We are to be fruitful. Amen. We are to answer or our, our, our fulfill our promises. Amen. So let's go into battle and not be fearful and faint-hearted. Let's go after this lost and dying world. Let's accomplish what God has placed us here for. Let's not be fearful and faint-hearted. If you are, the Bible just sends you home. I think about Moses. <laughs> Do you think he was fearful and faint-hearted initially about going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go? <laughs> but he went with the power of God. I think about Caleb and Joshua. We named our son after Caleb. Two out of those 12 spies that stood up for the Lord. Do you think that they weren't, if they were in their own flesh, fearful and faint-hearted? <laughs> Certainly they were. But with the power of God, they stood up and said, no, God has given us that land. Let's go in and take it. I think about Peter. Whew, can you imagine walking out on that water? <laughs> he got his eyes off Christ and he starts sinking. Do you think he was fearful and faint-hearted? But when he refixed his eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, had this power of God in his life. Wow, how awesome that must have been. Let me ask you, what battle are you facing today? This is a young church. Was it about a year and four months now it's been constituted, right? I'm sure you've already faced some battles. I'm sure personally there are folks in here that have faced battles. I think of uh, Brother Frisk's mother-in-law in that hospital bed facing a battle. Maybe it's a financial battle. Maybe it's a spiritual battle. Maybe it's a relationship battle. God doesn't want us to look at our troubles. He wants us to look at Him. Hebrews chapter 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 
the fearful and faint-hearted, we'll not experience true victory. We're to fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus. And just lastly, and just in conclusion here, I not only uh, see that we're to go and the, they preach the power of God and then they purge the people here, but lastly, they promoted and pre- prepared the people. Look at verse number 9. It says, And it shall be, when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. You know, some people read this verse and, uh, you know, they'll see the word captains here and words like lead the people. I think this is a great verse on leadership. And it is. But really in its context, it's really it's all about fellowship and about following God and having His power on your life. You know, these people here that were promoted here, it says promoted the captains, you know, they had all of these characteristics that we've discussed here this morning. You know, I think about people throughout my life that have been captains in my life. Our pastor, uh, original pastor, Pastor Fowler, 38 years here at Capital Baptist Church. He certainly was a captain in my life. I think about my dad. I'm sure he may not have been all that God wanted him to be, but I think about how he had a heart for going out and winning souls and I remember after he passed away, just looking through some of his belongings and how he had written down. It was hard to read his writing. He had glaucoma pretty bad, and uh, you know his, his writing was, was pretty atrocious. But you could see where he was writing scripture verses down, trying to memorize like the, the Romans Road and all of that. And I think about how, just to, as, as a father, about how he just made sure that we were in church. and He was a captain in my life. I think about a guy named Joe Huffman. You all wouldn't know him, but he was a captain in my life. He loved soul winning. Probably he's the one that got me loving soul winning. <laughs> he had this kind of kind of voice like this. Hey, Brother Mike, where are we going out today? <laughs> and it was just a joy going with him, going soul winning. And he, and he showed me just God's love for people and winning souls. Think, think about how my mom was a giver. She taught me about it, what, it was, what it meant to give so that others could have. I think about Sunday school teachers and junior work, church workers, one of which were responsible for leading me to the Lord. There's many captains. I'm sure that you're thinking of maybe some folks in your life. Your pastor. You have a great pastor. You know, we have people in many different age groups we, we find in Capital Baptist and here at First State Baptist you don't always uh, find a diverse group of people such as this but God is looking for all kinds of people teens, young adults married couples, older folks wiser believers that will be willing to enlist in this battle this battle that is raging out there. Well, I'd like to send you home today and say, oh, it's, it's just wonderful out there, you know. You're going to go out there and give out the gospel and a bluebird's going to land on your shoulder and, you know, it's just going to be, they're going to be so glad to hear from you. <laughs> and God will give you blessings of that once in a while, by the way. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that, you know, everything is going to be harsh. But if you've been involved in this battle at all, you know that it is raging. Let's go with the power of God. Amen. Let's not be one of those folks that were sent home. Let's live that dedicated life, that fruitful life, that life that, that, that doesn't have fear and trembling, that, that, that life that, that fulfills promises. Let's go out there and let's be a captain. Let's be a person that God uses for His glory out in this battle. I hope that you're encouraged this morning. What battle are you facing? I hope that you're saved here this morning. If you're here and you say, Brother Mike, I am not sure that I'm, 
saved even. I, I can't be in this battle because I don't know the Lord as my Savior. Get it settled today. There's no greater decision that you could make in your life. It has to be the first decision that you make. If you're going to be on that winning side. Boy, I love uh, Stephen Curtis, probably one of my favorite preachers. I think I've said that before up here. <laughs> If you get a chance to look at him, maybe on YouTube, you'll see some of his messages. But uh, one of his last messages that he preached, he had died of cancer. And uh, this message, he had stage four cancer. And he sang that song, I'm on the winning side. The Christian life is a great life to live. And we are on the winning side, amen. If you're not saved, get saved today. Enjoying that winning side. Christian Let's get involved in this battle out here. Amen. We'll do it together. All right? Let's pray.